So now we go on to the next part of the program. Uh, we have two uh, keynote talks, and uh, there's two keynote overview talks. Uh, uh, the first one is a talk by Matt Rodell. Uh, Matt's the chief of the hydrological sciences branch at NASA Goddard, and uh, uh, you know he's there's 65 scientists at the hydrological sciences branch, and he got his PhD at UT Austin. Uh, he has worked primarily on understanding the terrestrial water cycle, has numerous publications, and he's best known for applying the GRACE satellite, gravity recovery and climate experiment, all over the world in understanding the groundwater dynamics. So without any uh, delay, Matt. And Matt will give about a 33-minute talk. And please, uh, 33 and a half is not allowed. So I'm sorry. Uh, and, and after that, we have about 12 minutes for question and answers and to change uh, over to uh, Holly's talk. So uh, please save your questions till the end and ask a lot of questions to Matt. Matt. All right, thanks everyone. I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to talk with you all and i um, glad this finally happened after a uh, few speed bumps in the beginning there. Um, I listed myself as the author here. There are of course many, many uh, people who contributed to this talk and I hope I've mainly uh, provided um, uh, provided uh, you know naming those people when when necessary so I'm talking about state of the art and future pro prospects for observing groundwater from space um, start with a little bit of, uh, of motivation here um, so global groundwater dependence and depletion so as most of you know and as Tony alluded to um, there are many parts of the world uh, where people rely on groundwater uh, in some cases almost exclusively as their source of, of fresh water. Uh, there have been a lot of papers recently, uh, research studies that have shown um, that groundwater is being depleted in many parts of the world, um, highlighting one here by uh, Yoshihide Wada and, and colleagues, um, where they used, uh, they did a modeling study with, with observations incorporated into the model um, to look at areas of the world uh, shown in the lower left there uh, where the groundwater is being depleted at a, at a significant rate. Um, their model also produces things like groundwater recharge, uh, the top middle there, and, uh, and groundwater abstractions. Um, and so when you do the, uh, do the math on those, that's how you come up with the estimates of the, of the depletion. And on the right is showing um, trends in global water demand, uh, which is the top line there. Uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the number is a little hard to read there, but the numbers on the left are uh, cubic kilometers per year, uh, and the scale goes from zero to 1,000. Um, and then the middle line is, uh, uh, is a global groundwater abstraction, and, and then when you um, do the math on that, you end up with the uh, groundwater depletion, which is the bottom line. And as you can see, it's increasing over time. Um, the scale there goes from, uh, what is it, 1960, through a little past 2000. Um, so you can see that, that the, the demand um, is, uh, is, has been increasing, the depletion has been decreasing. Uh, and these are big numbers, by the way. So a, a cubic kilometer of water is, is um, it's a lot of water. So if you think of the largest reservoir in the United States, which is Lake Mead, it holds about somewhere between 30 and 35 cubic kilometers of water. So when you're talking of hundreds of cubic kilometers of water, it's, it's a lot. Another recent study, um, this is one by uh, Dalin et al, um, looking at uh, one of the major causes, or probably the major cause of groundwater depletion, which is agriculture. And so the left is showing, um, the background map sort of shows aquifers where, uh, where there's um, significant um, uh, groundwater stress. Uh, and then um, the, the uh, pie charts show which um, which specific crops are, are responsible or, or the major crops that are being grown that, that are causing um, that stress. Uh, and the depletion is, is, uh, is represented by the size of the, the, that circle. Um, so as you can see, some of the, some of the, um, the drier parts of the world, of course, um, there's a larger uh, reliance on groundwater and, of course, um, greater depletion. And then on, on the right, it's, it's a little hard to read up here probably, but, um, but this is showing the, 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 the water or groundwater embedded um, in the international food trade. Uh, and so um, you can see, for example, a lot of food coming out of the U.S. 
uh, is responsible for, for groundwater depletion uh, in the U.S. So let me give you an overview of uh, large-scale groundwater science. Um, so in the 20th century, not that long ago, uh, groundwater science is almost completely reliant on in situ observations. Um, so you may, mainly using monitoring wells, also as piezometers, um, doing pumping tests. Uh, you can use uh, the well drilling logs to look at the, the type of uh, aquifer material. Uh, ground penetrating radar in some cases can be useful. And there are other geophysical methods and geological mapping techniques. And then in terms of modeling, um, you know, there are some, uh, some older uh, groundwater models that were fairly crude or highly localized. You couldn't really run them over large scales. And, and of course, you're limited by the availability of information to parameterize those models. Um, you can do some useful science still, though. This is a paper by uh, Byling Lee et al. Uh, looking at uh, data from mainly from the USGS and some others, and also from some state agencies, groundwater data that were archived and, and publicly available. And uh, you can see it's you know, there's some networks in the eastern U.S. In particular that look fairly dense when you're looking at this sort of large scale. Um, you know, if you got into the smaller scale, you'd find that there are plenty of townships where there's not a groundwater observation, for example. Um, but you can do some useful things like looking at groundwater variability. And it wasn't that long ago um, that people, some people even on the planning committee, who thought that groundwater variability was basically uh, negligible. Um, but if you look at the time series here on the right, uh, focus in the middle, um, uh, the, the black line is the, is the mean. Um, and this is looking at the upper Mississippi River, River Basin, which is shown in yellow on the left. Black line's the mean. and the uh, the, the orange lines are all the individual wells in that region. And you can see that, um, for example, in 1988, there was a big drought in the upper Mississippi. You can see that very, you know, stands out very clearly uh, in the well data. And then a few years later, in 1993, there was flooding. You can see groundwater gets pretty high. It's a peak around then. Um, and so it's, you know, it's, uh, you can do some interesting science with these data, but it's, you know, they're, you're limited and there's, there are only so many wells that, that, uh, for which data are available. So, um, so for example, there's, you know, the USGS archives a lot more wells than what I'm showing in this, in this figure. Um, but in order to do this study, we had to, uh, we had to sort of do a, a culling of the of the information. Picked out wells that are not directly affected by pumping or injections. Um, we wanted wells that were tapping unconfined or semi-confined aquifers. The reason for that is because it's very difficult to convert a um, uh, a measurement of head in a confined aquifer into a, into a change in, in water storage. Um, we wanted at least four depth of water measurements per year in order to get you know a seasonal cycle and a minimum of a 10-year record. When you do that, you're, you're cutting out the vast majority of wells that are available uh, for study. Um, of course, you know, we have it fairly good in the U.S. Um, the lower right is showing uh, the USGS Groundwater Climate Response Network, is, which is sort of their network where they've already done this. Um, they, they, they've uh, boiled down the wells to the ones that are, uh, that are useful for climate monitoring. And it looks, again, pretty dense in the, in the northeastern U.S. Um, you look at some states like Wyoming, and maybe there's only one or two wells there in, that, in, in a huge state like that. Um, but then, you know, again, we're doing well compared to the rest of the world. The upper right is showing that there are only eight countries that, that contribute groundwater data to the groundwater, uh, Global Groundwater Monitoring Network, um, which is uh, at, at an institution called IGRAC in the Netherlands. Uh, they collect data similarly to how the Global Runoff Data Center, shown in the lower, uh, lower left there, um, collects data for, for runoff. Um, and so most countries, well, you know, most countries have some sort of groundwater data, but they don't make them publicly available um, is the issue. So things like uh, their, their coverage gap spatially and temporally, their delays in, in the availability of the data, uh, measurement constitu uh, con continuity and consistency. And the, the big things, though, is, is that, um, you know, there are political restrictions. So even if they have groundwater data and even if they are digitized, which, you know, is not always the case, and even if they are centralized, you know, whether or not the general population is allowed to access them, um, oftentimes they're not. 
So moving on to the 21st century, we're doing a little better now. Uh, we have remote sensing, um, particularly uh, satellite gravimetry, which I'll talk about quite a bit in a moment. Um, there, you also do things like airborne and satellite interferometric synthetic aperture radar, INSAR. And we have um, uh, better modeling capabilities driven in large part by uh, you know, advances in, in uh, computer power and, and uh, the amount of data that you can store. Um, so there are regional to global land surface models with groundwater budgets, and some of the models are more advanced and have uh, 3D flow capability. And then we can do things like um, coupling those to the atmosphere uh, and, and data assimilation where we constrain the model using the available observations. So, uh, so let me talk a bit about remote sensing. Um, NASA has a fleet of Earth-observing satellites, and, uh, and quite a few of them are actually highly relevant to the water cycle. And so if you're, you have an observation that monitors the water cycle, it's probably going to be at some, you know, in some way relevant to, to groundwater studies. Um, but some of them are more relevant than others, um, particularly uh, GRACE and GRACE follow-on. Um, uh, the GRACE mission ended in 2017. GRACE follow-on launched in 2018. And, um, and those, are very, those are quite valuable for groundwater. Uh, this is just an example of what you can do with some of these remote sensed uh, data. Uh, here the, um, the yellows and oranges that are, uh, are precipitation uh, measured by the GPM, Global Precipitation Measurement Mission. And the, uh, the blues are showing uh, soil moisture wetness uh, from the SMOS mission. And so you can see how when, the, when a, a rainstorm goes over Australia, it sort of wets the land surface. And then there's this memory where it takes a little while uh, for it to dry out again. Um, and when you look at, uh, uh, we can only do this really with a model, but if you look at groundwater time series, um, you know, same sort of animation, you would see that, that groundwater moves uh, or changes even more slowly than this. So there's, there's a long, uh, longer residence time for groundwater and the variability is slow, and that's one of the reasons it's such a valuable resource is because you can have a drought and still have plenty of groundwater available. So let me talk a bit about GRACE. Um, GRACE is really different from other missions. You know, most remote sensing missions um, use some sort of radiation-based approach. They're measuring light that's either emitted or reflected from the surface, and then that information is used to, to uh, uh, to estimate quantities like the snow cover or the vegetation type or, uh, or ice or rainfall or soil moisture. But they're limited in that they can, you can only uh, penetrate the surface a few centimeters uh, for the most part. So you can't really see groundwater using this type of measurement. GRACE is totally different and GRACE follow-on as well. So both of them uh, were, were twin satellite missions, one satellite following the other around the Earth. And instead of looking downward at the Earth and measuring some sort of you know, emitted or reflected radiation, the key measurement is actually the distance between the two satellites. And the reason they're measuring that is because uh, Earth's gravity field perturbs, you know, or variations of Earth's gravity field perturb the orbits of the satellites. And so if you can monitor those orbits, with extreme precision, which is what they do. Basically, one satellite is monitoring the orbit of the other satellite at all times. Um, then you can, you can basically model how the uh, gravity field changes over time. And changes in the gravity field are largely caused by changes in, uh, in the water stored uh, on and in the land surface. So if you can deal with things, if you, if you can use an atmospheric model to, to, uh, to estimate the atmospheric um, mass changes or circula mass circulation in the atmosphere, and you have uh, ocean models to deal with the uh, oceanic uh, mass changes, then what's left after you remove those is basically gravitational changes caused by changes in, in terrestrial water storage. Um, so again, the, the, the key measurement here is, is the distance between the two satellites. So the satellites are, you know, they, they're, um, they're sort of free floating and they're somewhere between 100 and 200 kilometers apart most of the time. Um, they're measuring the distance with a K-band um, ranging system. There's also a uh, laser ranging system on, on GRACE follow-on. Um, using the K-band system, they can measure this distance, um, you know, this 200 kilometer distance, they measure every five seconds um, down to the precision about the size of a, of a red blood cell. So in, incredibly accurate or precise measurements. 
And again, when you put all this data over the course, into, course of a month into a uh, big regression model, you can come up with a map over its gravity field and then from month to month see how, that, how the gravity field is changing in response to changes um, particular on it in the land surface. Uh, so what do those changes look like? Um, we call this uh, terrestrial water storage, which is the sum of all the components of the water stored on and in the land surface. Um, if you look at the state of Illinois, which is one of the few places in the world where you have ground-based observations of groundwater, soil moisture, snow, and surface water, you can put together a time series averaged over Illinois, which we did several years ago, shown in the top here, um, where uh, it's, it's water storage as an equivalent height of water. And what we've done is the blue is the groundwater, and then uh, superimposed on top of that is red, which is soil moisture, and you see large changes in soil moisture. And then white is snow, and, and for Illinois, the snow, the snow water storage changes are actually pretty small relative to the groundwater and the soil moisture. And, uh, and surface water, things like reservoir storage changes, average over Illinois, are actually negligible. You can't even see them. Um, but what you can see, again, is that the groundwater storage changes are pretty uh, significant. They're not quite as large as the soil moisture on a seasonal basis, but on an interannual basis, they, they can actually be bigger. So total terrestrial water storage is sort of the top line, you know, the, the top contour of that graph. And that's what GRACE is measuring. And uh, so if you look in the lower right, that's showing a time series of what we call terrestrial water storage anomalies. So it's the difference from the long-term mean at each location. So if it's blue, that means it's wetter than, than the long-term mean. If it's red, it means it's drier than lo the long-term mean. And so, uh, again, a large part of these changes are, are changes in, in groundwater, or a large part of these anomalies, I should say. Um, one of the limitations of GRACE, though, is it can't tell you the total amount of water in an aquifer, for example. I get that question all the time. You know, how much water is, is left in, in an aquifer? And it can't, can't tell you that. We can only tell you how it's changing. Uh, over time. One of the cool things we can do with, um, with the GRACE data is look at um, long-term trends. So if you have a, a time series uh, from GRACE, this case we use time series from 2002 to 2016, we remove the seasonal cycle and then we fit a trend at each location. And this shows you where terrestrial water storage has been changing um, on average uh, over the course of 2002 to 2016. Uh, this is in units of, uh, of centimeters per year, equivalent height of water. Um, and then, you know, sort of a challenge for hydrologists is to determine uh, which of these trends are caused by just sort of natural variability, and they're likely to bounce back at some point, uh, which are caused by water management or mismanagement, and uh, which may be associated with climate change. So natural variability, if you want to study that, you probably want to look at um, how precipitation was changing during the same time period. So uh, the top right is showing the percentage of normal precipitation um, during 2002 to 2016. There are a few places that pop out that got more or less uh, precipitation. Um, so areas of increased precipitation, I'm circling here on the right, uh, on the, lo the lower, lower right panel showing um, uh, precipitation trends as well. And some of these line up with areas uh, where there's um, an increase in terrestrial water storage. So we might say that, you know, it was the precipitation change that caused the change in terrestrial water storage. Similarly, there are areas where either uh, precipitation was below normal during this time period, or there's a downward trend in precipitation, and we happen to see uh, similar trends in terrestrial water storage. So again, Part of the, part of the uh, answer to why the water storage was changing um, may have been the, the changes in precipitation. It could be just natural variability and it could come back at some point. Um, if we're interested in you know, the climate change impacts, you might want to look at the, the projected um, precipitation changes um, that you see in the uh, IPCC reports. Um, so this is showing the uh, predicted increase of precipitation, increase or decrease, in the, um, the high scenario, uh, you know, a lot of carbon dioxide by the end of the and this is by the end of the century. Um, and there are areas where, uh, where we see uh, an increase, a predicted increase in precipitation. There also happens to be somewhat of an increase in, in um, terrestrial water storage. So perhaps this is a sign that there's a, um, a climate signal in the terrestrial water storage data and similarly areas where there's a, a predicted decrease in precipitation, we're seeing decrease in terrestrial water storage. 
And then finally, uh, the water management. Um, irrigation is the, is the largest user by far of terrestrial water storage and, and groundwater irrigated crops. And there are some areas of the world where we know that irrigation is extremely um, intense, and those, um, some of these areas I've circled really line up very well with where we've seen terrestrial water storage depletion. And there have been quite a few studies um, that have focused on these areas, showing that, yes, indeed, the groundwater is declining. One area that's interesting, though, is there's an increase here that I've, I've uh, used an arrow to point to, increase in the terrestrial water storage data, which is an area of China where the Three Gorges Dam and several other dams have been filled over the past two decades, and, uh, and you can see an increase in trusted water storage that's caused by that. Um, one of the first areas we studied when we were um, looking at um, the trends in trusted water storage, um, uh, Isabella Veliconia and, and Jay Femme and I looked at uh, northern India back in, uh, in 2009. Um, we've done, we've looked at it again uh, more recently, and, and there's still a significant um, depletion of terrestrial water storage in that region. Uh, there's also, there are well data and other, you know, other reports, information where we know um, with, with high confidence that this is uh, reflecting uh, groundwater storage depletion. Uh, so much water is being pumped out of the aquifer to, to irrigate crops. A lot of those crops are are water intensive things like uh, rice or wheat, and uh, it's causing the, the groundwater uh, to decline um, rapidly. Um, we estimate a rate in this, this area I've circled about 19 um, cubic kilometers per year. So, uh, so every uh, two years, or every uh, every three years, are using two Lake Meads worth of water in this region, and it's gone. You know, they use the water. The crops, it's in it. Most of it evaporates. Some of it runs off, but it's not. This is the water that's not recharging the aquifer. It's it's gone to the ocean or wherever else. Um, in India, you know, we when we published that study, it was um, it, you know it was it was shocking and and well received, um, but it wasn't like there wasn't data available already um, where people could have figured this out. They, it's hard to even see here, but there's so many little tiny dots here that are that are. Um, uh, there are dug wells or pisometers um, all over India, but you know the data were not made available to the public, so people couldn't do this kind of study without using remote sensing data. Um, back to the emerging trends, uh, we published a paper last year um, that looked at uh, the causes of these trends in terrestrial water storage around the world. Um, you can find this paper as uh, in nature last year, if you want to look, I'm not going to go through all these, um, but suffice to say that a lot of these um, depletion trends that we found are caused uh, either in part or wholly by uh, groundwater uh, depletion. Um, so talking about satellite gravimetry, let me just talk about the, you know, it's it's not a panacea, right? So there's there's issues with it. One of the big things is that the spatial resolution is very low. So talking about areas um, larger than about 100,000 square kilometers, you know, at best. Um, size of the state of Illinois is about 150,000 square kilometers, so we can barely get, you know, look at an area smaller than the state of Illinois. The primary limitation there is um, what we call spatiotemporal aliasing, which basically means we're not measuring each location on Earth um, with grace or grace follow-on often enough, and there's high-frequency variations in, in the atmosphere in the ocean that then alias into the these monthly averages that we get, um, and we really need um, more observations, which would mean more pairs of satellites in order to address that. Uh, monthly re uh, monthly temporal resolution is an issue in some cases. Uh, data latency, if you're going to use GRACE data for an operational uh, application, um, that can be a real problem. Um, the standard data latency for GRACE was about two to four months. Um, with Grace follow-on, they promised to have a what they call quick look product, which would be available within about two weeks. And there's also this lack of vertical information. So I showed you before that terrestrial water storage is the sum of all the components uh, of, of water stored on and in the land surface, and and Grace gives you no information on whether the the change in, in the terrestrial water storage was in the groundwater, or the soil moisture, or the snow, or or whatever. Um, opportunities, uh, Tony might be interested in this, so um, again, if you want to address the, the low spatial resolution, you'd really need to have multiple 
pairs of grace-like uh, grace -like satellites. Um, there are new technologies that are being studied. One is um, using laser inter interferometry, which is what Grace Follow-on has. But if you could pair that with a uh, lower altitude satellite, um, which would have to be drag-free, meaning you have a drag-free propulsion system on it, um, then you can get potentially get some higher resolution, although that doesn't get past this uh, aliasing issue. Uh, another new technology is being studied is something called cold atom gradiometry, where you have a single um, satellite system and you're actually measuring how the uh, gravity affects um, atoms as, the, as, they're, uh, as they're moving around within the satellite. And this, this, is, uh, um, this is something that's being, uh, technology is being developed by, by Goddard and others. Um, maybe there are other new te te technologies I'm not aware of. Um, and finally, data simulation is a tool that we are already using to, um, to address the spatial resolution, uh, latency, et cetera. I want to talk about one more um, remote sensing technology, which is INSAR. I mentioned this before. So INSAR relies on a satellite um, uh, making a measurement of, the, of the, uh, the elevation of the surface and coming back again, looking at how the elevation has changed. Um, and, uh, and the reason this is important is because when, when the groundwater level changes in an aquifer, um, it's sort of holding apart the, the aquifer media, the, the, you know, the pores are being pushed on by the water. And so when you remove water, there can be compaction. Um, and so over time, if you're depleting an aquifer, you're going to see the, the, the uh, land surface um, uh, subside over time. Uh, it's a famous picture on the right. Um, actually from 1977, showing where uh, in the San Joaquin Valley in California, uh, where the land surface used to be before they're pumping all this water. And, you know, by uh, 2019, he'd, he'd probably be, this guy would probably be, you know, 30 feet above the surface. Um, and uh, so again, what's happening is the aquifer is compacting. This is what you're measuring with, uh, with the INSAR is, the, is how the, the land surface is changing. And we may be able to do something in terms of um, estimating how much water has been removed. Now, the issue again is that you know you take water out of the aquifer. When you put the water back in, it doesn't. It's not elastic, so it doesn't come back up as much. Uh, this this graph in the in the lower right shows you how it sort of changes over town. There there's more there's more down than up. Um, so it's it's difficult to uh, to directly link a change in the land surface height to a change in in the in the aquifer water storage. Um, so here's some uh, some imagery. You know, the, the the big advantage of this, of course, is you get extremely high spatial resolution. So, so here's uh, from Palsar. Uh, here's uh, uh, changes in the um, in the height of the land surface from July 2007 to December 2010, and then May 14 to January 2015. These are during times of drought, and then. May 2015 to May 2017, see some pretty huge changes, and the scale over there goes up to um, 60 to 70 centimeters of, uh, of subsidence. Um, and this is showing some time series for some of these regions of how the land has subsided. And then uh, there's some rebound when you do get finally get some some rain recharging the aquifer. But look at the scale over there; it only goes up to four to five centimeters of, of rebound. Um, and this is uh, credit Tom Farr at, uh, at NASA JPL who, who developed these maps. So INSAR, you know, again, I, I think I've already covered this, but um, the big advantage is the spatial resolution. But the main issue is that um, you have this non-elastic aquifer response. There are also issues of things like when the vegetation grows or you plow the field, you know, you're changing the heights a little bit, and then that's you have to try to interpret that. So um, future of freshwater remote sensing, um, I'll just mention the, the uh, uh, National Academy's Decadal Survey that came out um, last year. Um, and some of the key observables that were recommended, well, there's the, the Surface Water Ocean Topography Mission, or SWAT, uh, which will measure um, uh, surface water and, and hopefully be used to estimate the rates of river discharge. Uh, that one's already in development. The Decadal Survey recommended uh, a, another precipitation measurement uh, Precipitation measurement mission, which is um, which is critical if you're doing any kind of hydrology. I also recommended another mass change mission, so a follow-on to Grace follow-on. So that's great news for for us who are interested in groundwater. 
and then further down in, in, in their uh, in their report were things like snow depth and snow water equivalent, uh, planetary boundary layer, um, soil moisture, and evapotranspiration. Um, another thing to think about is that uh, we shouldn't necessarily only be uh, considering these these large sort of flagship uh, space agency missions. Um, there are a lot of other types of obser observations that are valuable for monitoring the, uh, the water cycle. So you can put sensors on commercial aircraft, for example. Um, already we're putting sensors, sensors on the International Space Station. Um, there are all sorts of ground-based techniques. You can use citizen science. You can, uh, you can use information on the, how fast the, uh, the signal goes from your cell phone to a tower to estimate uh, precipitation rates. So there are a lot of other things that, that we can be doing besides just looking at uh, flagship missions. And this is summarized in this um, paper by Matt McCabe et al. that came out in 2017. So let me talk a little bit about, about uh, modeling and data simulation. A land surface model is basically an, uh, uh, sort of like the, the land component of a climate or weather forecast model. Um, divides the, the uh, earth up into a grid, and then at each grid point, um, it may subdivide it into different vegetation types. And then you have uh, equations that represent all the processes. You know, what happens to the water and the sunlight after it hits the, after it hits the land surface? And so um, we can do things like uh, uh, assimilate the GRACE data into, into a land surface model. So the land surface model provides the high spatial and temporal resolution um, provided by the, the model parameters and the other inputs, things like precipitation and solar radiation, and then you use the GRACE data to constrain the land surface model. And so when you combine the two, you come up with something that's better than, than either of them. So the, the top um, panel of the animation here is showing the GRACE terrestrial water storage anomalies, and the lower panel is showing um, what happened, you know, the model output when you simulate those anomalies. And you can see there's a, there's a higher uh, spatial resolution in the model output, and, but overall the, the patterns are generally the same. Um, there are more advanced um, groundwater flow models that are available now. Uh, I mentioned a couple here. One is one's called ParFlow. Um, uh, Laura Condon's here, and she was one of the key developers of Parflow, along with Reed Maxwell at, uh, um, at um, uh, CSM. And, uh, and then the right shows the PCR Globe WB model, um, which in the very beginning of my talk, I showed some results uh, from uh, Yoshi Iwata that were based on, uh, based on this model. Um, and, uh, and both of these models have the advantage over what I was showing before. Um, in that they can they can simulate 3D groundwater flow, so not just not just the changes in storage that some of the more simple land surface models do, but actually how the water flows um, up and down and in all different lateral directions. Um, some of the various um, observations that are useful for groundwater modeling, um, you know, there are a lot. Uh, the, the precipitation I mentioned is key. But any of these other things like soil moisture or stream flow, they all provide constraints that we can then use in our analyses or assimilate into our models to improve our estimates of, uh, of uh, groundwater storage. Um, and then our wish list would be things like um, the root zone, you know, so deeper soil moisture, um, higher resolution terrestrial water storage, et cetera. So here's my summary. I have 15 seconds left, so, so um, I'll let you read this. Um, uh, maybe I can talk about it a little bit here. The, so groundwater is a vital resource, as you know. That's why you're all here. Um, it's hard to find long-term reliable in-situ groundwater data, and that's why um, remote sensing and modeling are, are important. Um, advances in remote sensing could eventually improve spatial resolution, resolution and accuracy and timeliness of what we currently have from, from things like GRACE. Um, and, but in the meantime, Integrating the data into a land surface model um, is one way to downscale and disaggregate and interpret these uh, water storage observations that we get from from uh, uh, from Grace, Grace follow-on, and INSAR, et cetera. So, thank you. Matt, thank you so much for staying on wonderful time. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. I know that was a lot. Let me keep talking for another 12 okay. minutes. Okay. Here. No, no. <laughs> Hi, Matt. Um, 
from the US map of groundwater well observation, it seems like some of the states are barely being monitored. At the same time, that map from India showed that there are quite a few wells, I mean, quite a few observation wells all over the country, but that data may not be available to us scientists. Is that where the problem is? That even if the world is, I mean, even if groundwater is being monitored all over the world, there is no consensus or bringing that data together. Is that where the problem is? There, there. Yeah. Why don't you tell your name so that everybody knows everybody? Uh, Ali Akanda. I'm from the University of Rhode Island. I'm an assistant professor working on water resources, and groundwater is one of the areas that I focus on. So, so you're you're correct. Um, there are multiple issues here. Uh, now, if I showed the USGS map of all of their wells. Or all you know, all the wells that all the states archive, it would be much denser. But we've already we've already just um, removed a lot of the wells that don't have a long enough time series. Some of them maybe just have one observation ever, and we've also removed the wells that are in confined aquifers or wells that are affected you know directly by by uh, withdrawals. So when you do all that, um, you end up with a much smaller number. The map I showed of India, I ha hadn't done that yet. So presumably, if you're if you if you narrow that down to just the really useful wells, um, there would be a lot fewer wells. But the issue remains that, that most countries of the world, while the governments may have access to data, um, they don't make them available. But before you even get to that point, I mean, maybe the data is all, you know, all on paper and no one's taken the time to digitize them yet. Um, or maybe if they have, they're, you know, they're, they're all over the place. They're not centralized in one location. And then finally, do they make them available to the public? In some cases, like, like in India, it's become much easier for um, Indian citizens to, to get access to the data, but, but I still can't get it myself as, as a U.S. citizen. So, so a lot of issues contribute to the problem. And, and of course, there are areas like, um, you know, like Iran, which may have significant groundwater issues, but good luck getting any groundwater data from them, right? Uh, Ed Bigley, Northeastern University. Could you say a little bit more about, um, you were talking about the resolution of the GRACE data, with the, where right now we have one pair of satellites up there. You know, if we had two pairs, like what, or three pairs, or four, what kind of spatial resolution could we eventually get down to? Yeah, so if you had a, a you know, two or three pairs, um, I think you would still probably only be getting down to, you know, maybe half of where we are now. So maybe you'd be at 50,000 square kilometers instead of 100. It, that's, that's, again, it's the biggest, it's the biggest issue in terms of um, spatial resolution and accuracy is, is the spatial temporal undersampling. But to get down to really, you know, much higher resolutions, we would need um, some of these more advanced technologies that I, that I brought up. Isabel, do you agree with that, what I said there? I, I forget the numbers on if you have two or three pairs. Yeah. Yeah, I think with two pairs, they, you would already get, yeah, you, got, you could get down probably a, you know, a scale, which is like halfway, you know, 50 kilometers. But, how, how many? But they, I think with two pairs, one in an almost polar orbit and one with a lower yeah. orbit. But the issue would be the, the fact that we have to remove all the sub monthly signal. However, it is true that eventually those model, you know, once we have the data, as soon as we got improving that, you know, we can reprocess the data and get information. So that would really, I think, be a big game changer. I also think that there are some approaches when you use the GRACE data that you can, you know, leverage on, you know, again, try to see, you know, if you can, the resolution is there, but maybe because of the spatial variability of the signal, the time variability of the signal that you want to monitor, you can isolate it even in a big, big footprint. I mean, as long as the signal is cross-correlated, you know, at those scale, then you can, so I think that there is a lot of potential also in trying to identify, you know, how can we push the boundary using this. Okay, great. Uh, Isabella Veliconia from University of California, Irvine. If you don't use the mic, then you won't be okay, recorded. Okay, there it works. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, so Tony laid out several issues, logistical issues for the armed forces, transboundary water rights, and so forth. Just 
you know, at, at one level, I think it is breathtaking to see a global view of groundwater or total water, sto water, water storage. On the other hand, if I wish to inform the questions that Tony asked, I'm struggling a little bit. Uh, you know, I can see these are proxies, but I don't see how exactly they work. Uh, but maybe there is a future. And if you could talk a bit about how these map over to those sort of questions. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, there are definitely things that we cannot address. For example, Tony was mentioning, you know, where is the groundwater? You know, sorry, I can't really help you there. Um, you know, but and things, you know, sort of a policy discussion on, you know, how is groundwater changing and how might that affect, um, you know, regional conflict or, or movement of people and that sort of thing. Um, I think we can we can provide some information on how the groundwater is um, changing over time, and in particular, as I said, if we uh, use the models or we use these more advanced technologies like uh, like INSAR, we can get down to the resolutions um, that are that are useful. You know, I agree that you know the global map. You know, I don't know how much help that provides to Tony, but but when we start doing the downscaling using the uh, using the Lanceverse modeling, and if we applied INSAR, if we had one of these advanced technologies, um, I think we get to the point where we have uh, information that is valuable for some of the things that, that Tony's asking about. Hi, Sasha Sauer from the University of Oregon. Um, I work on INSAR groundwater monitoring. Um, I really like your, your part of data integration because we, we are now having monitoring with GRACE, which looks at gravity inside, that looks at deformation. We have SMAP and SWAP. So my question is like, do you think we have the capability in modeling to integrate all these different data sets together to really take advantage of the multitude um, data we have from remote sensing? Or do you think we're not there in terms of the modeling capability yet? I think we're, we're getting close. So for example, the land information system, which is um, a modeling system developed at, at NASA Goddard, um, it's basically a framework if you can run multiple different um, land surface models, and some of them are better for, for modeling groundwater than others. And it also allows you to do data simulation. And we can already assimilate SMAP and SMOS, GRACE, uh, leaf area index, um, uh, snow cover and, and uh, snow water equivalent. Uh, we haven't gotten to the point yet where we can do, we can assimilate INSAR information. Um, and I think that's gonna take take a while, we're gonna to have to get better you know, at INSAR, and then also in our models, we'd have to, uh, we'd have to be able to simulate um, how the, the surface variations change and how that relates to the, to the groundwater storage. But to answer your question, I think we're, we're getting close. We can do a lot of it, we can't do all of it yet, but uh, we're continuing to push, and we actually have a, um, a new uh, proposal where we're, we're um, proposing to couple PARFLOW, which is one of the more advanced models I showed, um, with the land information system, so you'd be able to run, uh, you know, using a, you know a very sophisticated uh, groundwater model, and then also do the data simulation um, uh, and other techniques that we we have available with LIS. The last question, please. Uh, Jim Dobrovolsky, I'm a national program leader for uh, USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture here in Washington, D.C. for the moment. Um, what I'd like to know is, uh, what about basic water quality differences, like freshwater, seawater, uh, so that we could actually evaluate maybe how um, the use of, of you know, water in managed aquifer recharge might help us to push back uh, saltwater wedges or what have you. A any any help there? Not much. I, and basically, nothing that I showed uh, really takes water quality into account or has any ability. So the remote sensing, you can't do anything with water quality. It's just, you know, massive water or, or a change in surface elevation. Uh, the modeling, I think, you know, maybe at some point in the near future, we get to the point where we're incorporating uh, water quality into some of these these groundwater models, but we're we're not there yet, as far as I'm aware. Um, but it is, you know, it's an incredibly important topic. I, I just uh, uh, maybe there are other people in the room who can provide more help than I can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. Thank right. you very Thanks, much. Thanks, Matt.